Hi, and welcome to episode number 162 of the weekly Google Cloud Platform podcast. I'm Mark Mandel, and I'm very excited to be joined yet again by Gabby Ferreira. How are you doing today, Gabby? I am very good. Thank you, Mark, for asking. How are you? I'm doing okay. Good to be joined by you yet again on the podcast. Yeah, I I love being here. It's nice. (laughs) <laughs> That's great. So today we are going to be talking to Mohammed al uh talking about Voicea and voice applications, which I'm pretty excited by. Yes, they he will show us the different ways how they are approaching ML to solve their problems. So that's going to be fun. Yeah, it's really awesome. And then afterwards, we have a question of the week that I think you're going to ask me. Yeah. So, Mark, what if I'm working in a terminal in Cloud Shell and I want to move to another computer? How can I continue my work? That's a great question. So we'll answer that later. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So why don't we get stuck into that cool things of the week? I think you had something right up first. So we announced this week you will be able to query inside BigQuery without having a credit card. Oh, nice. So that means that people like students and other types of organization can learn how to use BigQuery without having to provide financial information. And it provides up to one terabyte a month of querying capacity, which is a lot for a free tier. So that's exciting for me. That's very, very cool. Awesome. And my cool thing of the week, we have a great article talking about exploring container security, encrypting Kubernetes secrets with cloud KMS. This is actually really, really cool. So if you've used Kubernetes, Kubernetes has a thing called secrets where you can store data in it, especially things like passwords and whatnot. But by default, the Kubernetes secrets are stored in plain text, which if you want to put like really secret stuff in there is not ideal. But there is a new thing in GKE, which is application layer secret encryption that is in beta right now that you can take advantage of. It's pretty straightforward to set up. All you really need to do is specify the key that you want to use inside Cloud KMS to manage your secrets, and pretty much you're good to go. If you have a look at the article, it shows you a little getting started guide as well as links to some documentation to get you going. Cool. Also this week, using data analytics, the Golden State Warriors announced they're going to be improving their fan experience by using App Engine and Firebase together with Map. So you have the blog post there explaining how it's going to be done. And I have to confess, Mark, I did not know what Golden State Warriors were. (laughs) (laughs) We admittedly, we had to look it up. We had to go online. We're like, oh, it's basketball Mm. in Oakland close to where I live. <laughs> I thought it was yeah. baseball for like some that, reason. I feel like that's something I should know. Yeah, I'm sorry, people. <laughs> that's all right. There's a really great article uh, by our VP of engineering, Melody McFessel, who we are huge fans of. And you can actually listen to her more in episode number 158 from the podcast as well. Melody works very deeply in DevOps land. And she wrote an article talking about a recent survey sponsored by Google Cloud, by Harvard Business Review Analytics Services, talking about DevOps and basically the road to DevOps. And in the blog post, they outline seven steps for DevOps, as well as a link to the survey for more information. But in there, there's piloting a small project, being an open source player, embedding security within a software development process, apply DevOps best practices, provide immersive training, establish a no blame culture, build a culture that supports DevOps, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So check out the blog post for all the details as well as links to the survey as well. And to finish our list, the Telegraph in the UK announced a partnership with Google Cloud to help them to manage their media. They're going to be using cool things like AutoML to classify content. So imagine all oh, of those nice. contents that they have from way, way back, being able to classify AutoML and be more searchable, more easy to access now. That's very cool. And I think uh, I think we're trying to get them on the podcast too, aren't we? Yes, uh, they're going to be on the podcast and they're going to be able to talk more about that. I'll be interviewing them. So stay tuned. Well, why don't we go have a chat with our friend Mohammed over at Voicea? Yeah, let's go. I am exceptionally delighted to be joined by Mohamed al Chief Architect at Voicea, coming to chat with us today on the podcast about everything they do. How are you doing today, Mohamed? Good. How are you? Doing pretty well. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today and talking to us all about Voicea. Oh, thanks for having me. So, Mohamed, what do you do at Voicea and who are you? Tell us. All right, so my name is Mohamed al I'm a Chief Architect and co-founder of Voicea. I'm responsible for design and other architecture 
tasks here and I write code, I do some other tasks that founders do, uh, like changing the light bulbs and whatnot. So <laughs> almost everything you can imagine at startup. True story. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's a thing, yeah. Everyone <laughs> co-founders always have to do. That's awesome. So tell us about Voiceo. Like at a high level, what does this company do? Yeah, so as you can imagine from the name, we're all about voice and the enterprise specifically. Uh, so if you think really about like how we use voice in our day-to-day, -day, especially at work, there are like almost three big categories. One of them is actions that you take. Uh, so imagine, for example, if you have like an assistant, like Alexa or Google uh, Assistant, and then you talk to the assistant and executes the actions for you, like, you know, turn on the lights and so on. Uh, the big category for us is that workflow integrations that you actually want to automate a lot of actions and the enterprise. Uh, you can imagine you walk to a meeting and you're kind of lost. You don't know like what the agenda is, what is going to happen after the meeting is done. And we want to automate the process of the setting other outcomes of the meeting in a very concise way and converting those into actions. So you can say like our assistant is Eva, what's the stock price of Google today? Create a task for me to follow up with IT uh, regarding security policies. And this becomes an actual action or task in your task management system <laughs> like Trello or you know your system of choice. And then the other big category is information. So you are in a meeting and you want to capture or query some information from another system. So like, for example, like you can ask Eva, okay, Eva, uh, networks or social media. I'm not doing that now, I'm, I promise. <laughs> no, nobody yeah, does so that. So focusing on yeah. the conversations and focusing on the people there. So that's the biggest value add. I think uh, when you're in a meeting, you're very focused, you're present, and you have really high attention AQ. So uh, attention cotent, I think. So that's the, the word I was looking for. And uh, you want to be focused on the conversation and the people around you. And Eva will basically take care of like taking notes when you tell the assistant, like, this is an important moment and this is an action I want to be uh, following up with. That sounds really cool. You've also got integrations with a bunch of different systems. You mentioned like action items and like actually doing things. Can you tell us what does that actually look like in my day to day? Am I like sending notifications to via email or what, what, what are the cool things I can do? Right. So a lot of these systems actually allow you to like send them emails to create something in them. Uh, you can, for example, create a card in Trello or create a task in, in Jira or a ticket. And we plug in into a lot of them. So you can actually go to our website and explore what other systems we, uh, we plug into. And you can figure it easily with a single like email address. And Eva will send anything that you want to capture into these systems and basically starting that workflow, kicking off that action, which is maybe creating a note or creating a task and so on and so forth. If you imagine like you have your notepad and your pen and you walk to a meeting, you can actually talk and you can tell Eva that this is important and this is what I want you to capture instead of like scribbling and, you know, maybe losing a few minutes here and there of that meeting. Uh, you could have spent focusing more on the people around you on the conversation for sure. Awesome. So yeah, you're the chief architect and this is the GCP podcast. Like when you get into the technology side of things, what technologies do you use to make a reality? I'm, I'm guessing there's kind of two parts to it. I know there's like probably the transcription, but then there's also like pulling out the highlights and the action items and actually doing the actions. So what are the, what are the bits and pieces that you're using here? Right. So we're really big on Kubernetes. It's something that I have very deep appreciation for coming from a background where I actually built something very similar at Microsoft. It was really hard. It was really complex. And we understand like how life right now for startups and companies that are growing is much easier than it used to be like a decade ago. So you can actually just walk into your terminal and type in a few commands and voila, you have a cluster running in GCP, which is amazing. And you don't have to worry about a lot of things like provisioning and scale and, and so on and so forth. So this is one of the biggest items we have that we kind of don't worry about. So we let Google manage the Kubernetes installation for us and we worry about the application and growing the business. And basically the infrastructure is kind of well taken you know, care of in, in the GKE world, which is the Google Kubernetes engine. So our biggest like focus now is just how to understand the, the business and like growing the integrations and growing like, you know, the machine learning systems we have. And we don't worry about like oh, auto scaling or all of these things. Of course, we understand how GKE works and we know how to tweak it. To, you know, like our systems are very kind of complex as well, but it takes a lot of complexity away for sure. So Compute Engine, GKE, uh, Stack Driver, all of these tools, like, you know, also the storage systems and whatnot are really great for any startup to like, go to GCP and like start working on growing their business and not worrying about managing you know, services like that. 
So with all of this tooling that you use, sometimes you face up challenges because you have a learning curve, you need to learn how to use stock driver, you need to learn how to use this, how to use that. How does affect the development and the challenges that you ended up facing for your product on Voicea? That's a good question. So there are layers of abstractions that might isolate you from the underlying problems that a lot of distributed systems face. So back in the day when you're building your own, like set up your own cluster, you had to worry about like, where am I going to, you know, get my machines? So, you know, if I have to buy or provision hardware, I have to put it in a data center. I actually have to worry about like rack space. I have to worry about networking. I have to worry about security, physical security. I have to worry about a lot of things. And then after all of this, you still have to worry about the actual systems that are running uh, like databases and file storage and backing up systems redundancy, high availability. And on top of all of this, your application has to be up and running and available and performant and all these uh, nice characteristics. So if you think about the balance between doing all of the above versus learning a framework or learning something that's I think relatively simpler, like uh, how to work with Kubernetes or how to work with Stackdriver, I think we're in a much, much better place today. It, of course, can improve, meaning that there are actually some startups and some other companies whose entire business model is basically simplifying this even more. But I think it's the right balance for what I would call like uh, understanding the, the complexity underneath or basically peeling the layers of the onion. If you're working on an operating system, you need to understand a little bit of the foundations of this operating system, how it schedules tasks, how it manages files, and, and so on and so forth. Like In the world we live in, you have to understand the data center operating system, which is in our case, Kubernetes, like how it schedules like you know Docker containers and uh, what happens when you know some conditions are met and you know you might be in the risk of losing your data or not so there are, of course some constructs you have to understand but for the most part i think we're in a much 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 better space uh, or place uh, than before and uh, that allows us to move faster and focus on our own application concerns versus like you know learning way deeper things in the stack and of course you know the the thing I will emphasize in, in this is the more you know, the better you are. Like knowledge is power. And like if you understand Kubernetes very well and if you understand how like Stack Driver works, you're gonna be able to like perform faster and move faster. Nice. I'd love to hear more about like the flow of information too in the system because I'm guessing there's there's more to it than just Kubernetes, right? I'm guessing there's like some audio coming in, there's doing yeah. some processing maybe, and then are you running custom ML models? Are you putting like other tools in it? Like what's the what's that flow of information? How's that how's that all getting processed? Yeah, it's a great question. So our basic input is audio, right? And there's some metadata that are uh, associated with such audio recordings. So we join a meeting and we record what's happening. We also respond to commands and that's a technology in machine learning uh, known as uh, keyword spotting. So we run this in a very like real time fashion that you want to respond right away to the user's commands and execute them. So there's a really good like separation here between what we can classify as real time versus like near line versus offline processing of uh, audio and other metadata we we consume. And uh, we depend heavily on like Kubernetes to actually schedule all this workload for us. So the flow of the data is basically the audio is being captured real time and we're responding to commands using machine learning algorithms in real time. And we do one pass on the transcript and then we capture the audio and storage and then we do another multi-passes on that and we produce the, the transcript uh, for the for the user at the end. So as you can see, the, you know, the, the, the biggest like, focus for us is actually how to be always available, capture the audio and not drop it and also always be performant with really low latency to respond to these commands so that when you're having this experience, which is very, fairly unique, you have a very powerful computer or personal assistant on the phone with you on the conference line. So we're talking now on this line and we can actually invite Eva and Eva will be capturing this and responding to my commands, right? And telling Eva like highlight this or this is an important note or take an action and uh, as an action item and so on and so forth. So all of these have to be very 
performant and have very low latency. So we, we understand the complexities of like how to route audio and RTP or real time uh, protocol on top of Kubernetes. And we have like uh, certain requirements around like CPU utilization and memory utilization for these uh, systems that are processing audio in real time. Which is very important to understand, like you know, the, the constraints of the system when you're using one scheduler versus the other, and we're really happy with the balance we have today in terms of like how to like separate these like workloads in different node pools and like how to schedule them auto scaling so that we are not always like you know over provisioning the machine. So our workload varies according to like you know business hours in different locations, so we can actually kind of get an idea of when we're going to need more machines versus we're going to need fewer machines and, and so on and so forth for each system. So it's a very challenging problem, but Kubernetes is helping us yeah, manage that very well. Yeah, that's fun. What are you building your ML models in? Oh, so that's a great question about machine learning in general and like the philosophy we're taking <laughs> in, uh, in building systems. So as a very fresh or early startup, when we started a couple of years ago, we had this like list of principles about software engineering in general and specifically about like AI and machine learning in which we set a set of guiding principles for basically coming up with these decision-making framework. So when you ask somebody in the team, like, hey, what are you going to use to build this model? There should be a very easy kind of list of criteria to like make a decision. So for example, like as a company that's centered around voice and the voice of like our users is very important to us to protect, security is always top priority for us. So a lot of these systems like in machine learning are really good about like, you know, like security, like we're serving them through Kubernetes. So the training part of machine learning happens, of course, like offline. But if you're serving something online, we're protecting the data, we're making sure that everything is secure, encrypted. Uh, then we talk about like other frameworks, uh, characteristics that meet the other set of priorities for us or guiding principles. So you talk about speed of iteration and speed of iteration or velocity of iteration is extremely important in machine learning. Machine learning by definition or the way it's it's done is very iterative. It's extremely iterative, meaning that you start with some idea and you build some hypotheses and then you say, this would work on paper. And you actually go and deploy it in the wild and you get some feedback and you say like, okay, I'm going to have to improve this. And now you collect more data and you keep iterating on it. So there are a lot of frameworks today like TensorFlow and others that make this process extremely easy. We have also some flexibility around what framework you use thanks to a new framework called Onyx that allows you to build models using multiple frameworks and at the end you can serve them using one of them or a single like engine that you choose and you can serve from that. So we have some flexibility mm -hmm. and freedom that we allow folks on the team to actually use multiple frameworks, including on the cloud if they wish. But at the end of the day, we try to standardize the serving mechanism so that you always serve on Kubernetes. Nice. So with all this machine learning that you do with different models, how do you see you serving the enterprise world where the Everyone has a different demand. Everyone wants a piece of you in a different way. How do you see serving the enterprise in world? Yeah, so there is this concept of um, well-posed machine learning problems in the sense that these kind of problems, when you're trying to solve them, you build up something and you put it out there and users have some experiences with them. And then they use the data that come from the users or the results of their output as feedback so that they can learn more. And this is where we are, actually. It's, it's a virtuous data network effect, meaning that if you are using Voicea today, and let's say you're in a meeting, and then Eva transcribes something or creates a, a task for you, and there's a, a very, like, a, jargony word that you use that Eva did not recognize, you can go to our interface, you can mm. fix it there, and then we will learn from that. So that the next time we will actually, you know, make our best to like mitigate that or or fix it for you. And then the more users we have from the same industry, we can have a more explicit effort to actually prepare the the words that are pertaining to that industry or that domain first before you actually use the system. Or as you can see, the data network effect, the more you use it, the more it learns from you and then becomes even more accurate. So that's really a good place to be at when your problems will boast. Ooh, but what happens if you have the same term 
being used across different industries in different ways. Yeah, that's when actually you have to collect some metadata about who's talking and it's more personalized and then you can disambiguate between the two. Oh, cool. So they might sound the same, but they actually might be spelled differently. But because you know who's talking first, like, you know, I know your email, email address, I know some data about the speaker, so it's more personalized towards you. So you basically need the contextual information, right? Right, and we get that because you actually, you know, sign up with us, we know who you are, and we kind of let Eva learn from your idiosynchronicities, basically. So that's how you learn accents too, because I have problems with some assistants because when I say some words, they don't get it, what I'm saying. And accent is really hard, you know. Yeah, that's part of the solution, yeah. Nice. That's pretty cool. So obviously you're doing a lot of voice stuff. Is this just the beginning? Do you plan on doing more? Where do you see the voice interaction experience kind of growing? I would really love if I could have demoed our system because we are also introducing some video elements, specifically when it's a presentation or slides that you're showing inside the context of meeting. It's actually very interesting to see the interaction between the voice and the playback of the slides and the highlights of the meeting, the minutes that we captured. It's very rich experience and we're also looking for like something that we can capture, whether it's audio or video, to get more context about the meeting and give it to you in a consumable format that is easy to like, you know, integrate with your workflow. So today we actually, you know, also would have some playback of the slides or the video you had. What is the most interesting voice application you created at Voicea? The most like challenging and interesting thing you did with that technology? I have to think a little bit about this. There are a lot of challenges in building a startup from scratch. <laughs> and definitely yeah. when it when it deals with like non-deterministic input like speech. So you have a lot of machine learning domains that are easier than than speech or perceptual, you know, knowledge acquisition. So for example, if you're thinking of like recommendation systems, which is something I used to do at my previous life at LinkedIn, I think you have more leeway or you have more freedom in like showing the user like recommendations and so on on like for example the news feed. Mm. Uh, but when you're dealing with like human perceptual like task like I heard something and I can make sure that you know I need to make sure that this is the transcript for it it's a bit more challenging I want to say like for sure one of the most challenging ones is keyword spotting and you know responding to commands it's almost a magical moment when you walk to a meeting and then you can talk to the conference line and you get stuff done that's for sure a very like challenging process and it's a challenging problem because you need to understand the intent of what the user is saying you need to understand where this information should flow and you need to convert that data into an actionable outcome the, the combination of these problems i think is the most challenging and most interesting for sure fantastic what's been the on the customer side though what's been the most interesting integration you've seen Oh, definitely integrations with task management systems, because a lot of people like to keep track of what they're doing. And they think of meetings as a place where they get work done and a place where they can coordinate and discuss ideas. And then they come out with the, some like maybe handwritten notes or maybe some cryptic notes they captured during the meeting because they really want to be engaged and they just like type a few words here and there. But then now they can just get out of the experience with like a very nicely, like, you know, fleshed out list of outcomes that, that they just entered using or input using the voice. I think this is actually where voice shines. It's the natural way of communicating with computers. So anybody who's interested in uh, human computer interaction or HCI, they can tell you that in the beginning, we had the terminal, we had like just words and the like, command line and very like, you know, dull way of interfacing because that was the limitation of that era. And then we advanced a little bit to the graphical user interface or GUI. And that also because like, you know, we couldn't do better than that. If you maybe uh, saw some of the early systems that used voice or other natural UI methods of input, they weren't that good back in the day. So we had to like, you know, resort to like the mouse or the pointer and then some icons and whatnot. But now with the richness of machine learning techniques and deep learning and all the advances we had in the past, uh, I would say, five to six years, it became possible to actually walk to a room and have a $20 device that talks to you and you can do things with it, which is, in my opinion, like it's just a revolution of the, the UI and the way we interact with computers overall. 
<gasps> Does that meeting should have been an email? You probably are answering that question with Voicea right now, right? Because all the meetings, you get all of the stuff, keywords, what is important, you send to the integration systems for task management. So in the end, you have everything that you need just by having your device or Eva helping you. No, I think I think it's actually a very fair point. In the future, I wouldn't exclude us from doing something similar to tell you, like, maybe you shouldn't attend this meeting. <laughs> As a matter of fact, we are working on, on a lot of things that will help you make that decision. One of it is that we have as humans, intrinsic fear of missing out or FOMO. Uh, but you don't actually have to sit there for an hour and listen to the meeting if you can send Eva on your behalf and Eva will come back reporting to you, like, here are the important minutes. You can just, you know, spend one minute or a couple minutes to listen to, like, the important minutes or read them. And we worked on this very amazing concept in collaboration, which is teams and channels. So let's say I manage a team and you have a meeting with a client and they want to share this meeting with me so they can just create a channel and then I have access to the channel that uh, has all this like clients meetings and then I can coach them through it or I can uh, follow up with the the customers if I if I needed to be in that meeting and I couldn't make it for example or I'm double booked or triple booked so FOMO is very important and we want to satisfy uh, that itch by giving you like here's what's really happening uh with this like series of meetings in a very succinct way like here are the highlights and i think you know you can get a really good high value from just reading those or uh following up on those instead of attending all of these meetings <laughs> and i wouldn't be surprised if uh, we end up uh, answering the question should this meeting has uh, be an email instead <laughs> Or, or is it going to be like, don't have meetings with John? John tends to waffle. Uh, <laughs> like, <laughs> no, that sounds great. Uh, if people want to learn more about Voicea, like where where should they go to learn about this stuff? So definitely www.voicea.com. We're also on LinkedIn, on Twitter, Google Voicea, and interact with us. I would love to hear your feedback and sign up today. It's uh, free and you get a trial for our premium solution. And I hope you enjoy it. Cool. And if anyone wants to learn about any of the stuff you've talked about today, uh, it sounds like you're working on some really interesting problems. Do you have any resources that you recommend? Yeah, so uh, definitely uh, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we can get you a demo. And if you want to reach out personally, uh, I can also add my contact information here. And anybody on the team, uh, we have an about page and contact us uh, page on voice.com. Fantastic. Uh, before we run away, is there any other things that we haven't managed to touch on that you want to make sure that people know about? I think as a parting note, this is a very exciting era. And I think uh, folks, uh, like we've heard a lot of things about uh, AI taking over the world and AI being this fourth revolution after the industrial revolution, how it's going to change the shape and form of how we do work. I want to emphasize the way we're we're doing things and thinking about AI more of an augmented intelligence. So it's not here to replace your job. Some jobs, you know, over time will evolve and change and some of them are going to disappear. But I would send a message to everybody to say, like, think of AI as your friend and make sure that you know more about like what's happening because it's going to affect how we do work in the future. It's accelerated, definitely on an accelerated path right now. Of course, it's here to improve your job, not to take your job. But be friend AI. Thank you, Mohammed. Awesome. All right. Well, Mohammed, thank you so much for hanging out with us today and chatting to us all about Voicea. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Mohammed El Gaish, for helping us understand more of what the Voicea is doing and all the insights that you gave on machine learning on this episode. Yeah, super cool episode. Thank you so much for joining us. So, Mark, the moment that you're waiting for. Yeah. Question of the week. What if I'm working a terminal in Cloud Shell and I want to move to another computer? How can I continue my work? So that's a really good question. And I found this out the other day. I was really excited. So <laughs> if you haven't used Cloud Shell, it's kind of awesome. It's basically an integrated terminal that's built into Cloud Console. It also has a matching editor and a whole bunch of other fun things. So it means that if you just want to like get something done with G Cloud or maybe kubectl or something like that, and a bunch of other tools that come with it as well, it's just a really handy way of bringing up a terminal and getting things done. What's super cool about it is not only do you get like persistent disk storage for a certain amount of time as well, so you can leave stuff in there. And if you move from computer to computer, as long as you're accessing that on a regular basis, it stays there, which is really great. What I didn't realize, and 
the implications of which is it actually uses a piece of software called Tmux in the background. If you haven't used that locally, it's basically a terminal session management. It keeps those, those terminals alive and persistent. So what happens is, is, say you're working on one computer and you're like, that was cool. And then you go to the office and you're working on your workstation, for example, and you're like, oh, I wonder if there's still a running process running or I want to check what's going on. You open up your terminal and Cloud Shell will be like, oh, hey, I transferred your processes over from like the old computer to this one. So you can still see what's going on. And it's all the same. So for example, I was doing a bunch of cleanup. <laughs> uh, I had a, a, a slew of App Engine versions lying around. And so I'd written a script to just delete a whole bunch of them. It was going to take about half an hour. And I'd basically started it at home and then got on a bus and gone to work, got to work and then fired up Cloud Shell on my workstation, which was on my laptop. And it was like, oh, I wonder if it's finished yet. And I popped it up and I could see it was still processing. And I was in a completely different browser on a completely different computer. And I was like, that is awesome. Mind blowing. There's this untold joke that Cloud Shell is the best product that we don't advertise. <laughs> I think that's fair. So there's a link on the podcast post with the feature. So take a look there. Absolutely. Fantastic. All right, Gabby, uh, what are you doing? What have you been up to? Are you going anywhere cool? So I'm going to the Museum of Natural History. I've never been there before. Ooh. But I'll be giving a workshop on ML APIs and called Functions for their Brown Scholars program, which it is for oh, very cool. high school girls. So yep. that's going to be nice because it's going to be in Python and they know more Python than I do, probably. So Okay. So you'll teach each other things. Yeah, probably. <laughs> that sounds good. That sounds great. Fantastic. And you, Mark, what are you going to be doing? What am I going to be doing? I think the, the thing that's coming up most in March, Game Developers Conference, we will be there. Uh, all of Google will be there in all its glory. If you're into cloud stuff, though, make sure to check out all the sponsored sessions that we're running on Wednesday. We've basically blocked out the day. So if you want to learn about Econas or Open Match or machine learning or all sorts of other cool stuff that we're applying to games, definitely swing by. And then there's Cloud Next that is coming two weeks after that. I assume, Gabby, you will be there as well at Cloud Next with me? Yes. Excellent, excellent. So I'll be presenting there as well, and I'm sure you'll be there doing other fun stuff as well. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> excellent. And then way later down the line in, in April, I'll be at the East Coast Games Conference as well. So lots of fun things. Lots of fun things and travel to do. Yeah, exactly. I probably won't be streaming this week just because I need to get on a plane and go back to Australia for a bit. But otherwise, I'm sure I'll hop on there at some point again soon. Okay, I hope you solve your problems. <laughs> There are always more problems to solve. The never-ending list of problems. Okay, Mark, thank you. All right, Gobi. Thank you very much for joining me this week again. And thank you, everyone, for listening. And we'll see you all next week. See you all later. 